Hey, Anudeep. Uh, hello. Hey. Hi, Zikshan. How are you? We gave you a time that is perfect for neurosurgeons, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually am in California right now, so it's more perfect. It's six o'clock in the morning. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Like, we, we give you time perfect for a neurologist, and you don't get late. <laughs> yes, yes. And we also have a CNS Congress of Neurological Surgeons meeting, uh, annual meeting going on. Mm -hmm. So I'll be able to attend that right after this. So it worked out well. Perfect, perfect. Thank you for waking up <laughs> early for us. <laughs> Just like every day. Just like every day. <laughs> but I mean, on Sunday, you could have woken up two hours later. That would not have been a problem. I'm pretty sure the CNS Congress doesn't start at 6 a.m. The best of It starts at 7. So, <laughs> only conference that starts early. <laughs> okay. So, I think since the, the, I think our attending is going to be late, I think we should just start on time so that people have enough time to ask questions. So I will give it to the moderator. So we have student moderators who are leading the whole thing. Um, so we are going to give them the chance to introduce the, I would say the high, the most successful IMG match of match 2022, Dr. Anudip Yakula. Thank you so much for that introduction. Who's going to introduce him, Tejasvi? You're muted, I think. I think I'm on mute. I think uh, uh, Bhavya is here. Is is she? Bhavya can take up the introduction. She's here. Okay, Bhavya. I don't see a Bhavya. The B is a Bhavya. That's okay. Um, I think uh, our co-moderators they might not be here yet. Um, I can take up the introductions right now. Okay, thank you. All right. So, uh, hi, hi everyone. My name is uh, Tejas Pikant. I'll be moderating the session. Um, so I'm introducing Dr. Anudi Piekula, who graduated from Gunter Medical College, India as a valedictorian with several gold medals and scholarship funds. He began his USMLE journey with a career objective to be a neurosurgeon scientist. He worked with Dr. Bob Carter at the Center of Excellence for Research in Exosome Sciences laboratory at MGH Harvard Medical School, developing blood-based tests for diagnosis and monitoring of brain tumors. He has developed novel diagnostic assays that are currently undergoing clinical translation and is also a co-inventor of two innovation patents. He received several awards, including prestigious Journal of Neuro-Oncology Award from the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, CNS, he also received a seven-year grant funding from Glioblastoma Foundation. He later started his general surgery preliminary internship at the Yale New Haven Hospital, Yale School of Medicine. In 2022, he has matched into neurosurgery residency at University of Minnesota. His hard work, grit, and determination allowed him to match into one of the toughest specialties, despite being a visa requiring IMG. Dr. Ekula, uh, it's a pleasure meeting you and having you here. Um, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to see such a nice platform that Dr. Mansuri has created for us. Uh, I remember during my early days when I was preparing, uh, I used to watch Dr. Mansuri's post like all of us did, you know, uh, and it's so refreshing and exciting to like be on the other side, being invited by him to like, you know, talk to all of you and share a little bit of how uh, my journey is. So thank you so much for creating such a platform and thanks everybody for joining me. And thank you for that kind introduction. So um, just for me to understand the session is like 15 minutes long and I would just like, just go over my journey. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, I've started like all of you, you know, I'm from India. Uh, I did my medical school and went to medical college. And uh, looking back five to six years back then, you know, not 
uh, surg- uh, the pathways into surgery are not as well established as they are today. So it, it was a kind of uncharted territory and it's, it's always new and scary. And you face a lot of discouragement from everybody else when you speak of uh, specialties that are challenging historically. So my journey began like that too, but essentially, uh, when I came here to do uh, sub-internships, that's when I met uh, a few uh, residents and uh, Dr. Carter and Dr. Palai, who were such a tremendous support to me. I think fundamentally, if any of you is looking to aim or target uh, a, a speciality that is competitive, you need to fundamentally understand what are the basic foundational aspects that are needed. I think with the resources available, you already kind of know, but trying to break them down and I'll relate to my story as we go along. The first and the most important aspect is you need to be absolutely clear on why you wanna go into this. This cannot be driven by, oh, that person has gone here, so I wanna do it. So you need to deep, uh, dig deep into yourselves and really understand why you wanna choose that speciality. And that internal motivation is what will drive you uh, even when things don't go your way. And I think that is so fundamentally important. And anybody who do not have that grit uh, to begin with will see themselves falling short or failing uh, and getting discouraged in the pursuit. So once you've established that this is where you wanna go, of course, the first uh, thing that anybody recommends is to clear your steps. And I think that's a very obvious way, but also, interesting because that also tests how well you are able to take your exams, right? And I think that foundational knowledge is extremely important. And if you are not in a zone of, you know, excellence in the terms of your assembly step scores, you know, it gets definitely hard for you to match into those specialities. So that kind of gets you into a ballpark telling you, okay, am I competitive enough versus not? Having said that, scores are not everything, but scores are important and you need to realize that right from the get-go. And I do receive messages from students uh, with scores of 220s, 230s, uh, expressing interest in neurosurgery. And uh, it's not wrong that you like, but the system is just so competitive and the applicant pool is just such, it's so good that it's hard to stand out with 230, even with a lot of other things. So you always want to be uh, above and beyond in the terms of scores, just to prove that you know, you're medically strong and you have a great fundamental base, knowledge base to begin with. So moving on to the next and most important aspect, and uh, I'm sure there is a session and I think most of our speakers might have already uh, exaggerated or uh, emphasized the importance of research. So, and especially in fields like neurosurgery and training in uh, countries like here, and especially like when I see uh, what people are doing in in these conferences that I was just talking about, you see that the outlook towards neurosurgery is not just operating. It's beyond that. It's they are looking for candidates who can answer questions that are really troubling, you know, the clinical course of management. So they want people who can lead, they want people who can innovate. So that's where research comes in. They don't, they're not looking to see if you can publish 20 papers. They're looking to see if you have that drive in you uh, to take on this tough speciality where a lot of things are unknown. And I think they are looking for people who are problem solvers. So don't look at research as, okay, let me publish whatever uh, there is and that's what's gonna get me. I have 20 case reports, is that gonna be enough? You know, the, the point of research is not the volume. Of course, volume matters, but also the quality matters. And that's where I think a lot of our international students, including myself are at a disadvantage because 
you know, we don't have a lot of resources from where we come from. So on that note, I think the first thing, you know, anybody who is uh, amateur to research should do is use the local resources, such as, you know, a professors in our college, you know, some seniors, start with case reports, start with something so small. And there are several courses online on Coursera and stuff like that, where you can teach yourself to uh, do systematic reviews. So I think gaining that fundamental knowledge base in the terms of research is going to put you at a at a, at a better stage than others. So once you are trying to reach out to attendings here in the US or elsewhere for you know, more structured research, I think that's where you can use the foundational skills that you've developed to enhance your application. And once you come here to do research, you know, people typically do anywhere between three to five years of research because um, that's what it takes to get something quality out of uh, that experience. So once you come here, you know, the the change, the game changes, right? So now you are in the in the inner circle. Now it's up to you to take that opportunity and, you know, flourish yourself. So once you come here, there are plenty of opportunities. Everybody is doing great work. There are several avenues. There is basic science, there is outcomes research, there's global research. So there are multiple facets of research that are available and you can pick and choose which one you're most interested in and having that foundation definitely is important. And even in my case has helped me set myself apart from others. So. Research is extremely important, and the sooner you get your hands into research, the faster you'll be able to pick yourself up so that you are at a pace, uh, at a competitive pace when you are actually applying. So there's no uh, like rough numbers as to how many papers you need to get, but it also uh, highlights that you need to have quality papers and quality research. And of course, networking is an extremely important aspect of it and once you come do sub internships here once you do you know sub internships and research here you you build your network and going to annual meetings that's another way you can connect with people and a lot of sessions are virtual and that i think gives you a lot of opportunity to connect with you know the leaders in the field and you know, you can reach out for research opportunities. So there's no defined path, you know? So you need to, lead, you need to be smart about it. You need to be uh, strategic about it in the terms of finding your opportunities. You know, simple Google search will, you know, give you all the opportunities that are available and you can formally reach out to a lot of mentors. So, and uh, so that's extremely important. And adding on to the research layer is mentorship. So once you're down this path, you find mentors, be it in the research space or be it when you are in the sub internship and mentorship is extremely important because these fields are very close knit and everybody knows everybody. So, you know, having somebody who can vouch for you, who can open doors for you is extremely important. And not just opening doors, they are people who give insights into how you can improve yourself. And in my case, Dr. Carter, Dr. Balai have been such a phenomenal uh, set of people. They, they've, they've they've really like took me under their wing, you know, help me understand, help me understand what is required and, you know, help me navigate this challenging pathway. And I, I can guarantee that without them, you know, uh, I would be on the other side still, and you know, listening to how to get to this point. So, you know, mentorship makes a difference. And, you know, when you're in research and when you're in some internships, the relationships that you build with your mentors is extremely important. And you need to be kind, you need to be respectful, you need to be extremely honest. You know, they're not looking for path breaking Nobel Prize winning minds. They're looking for good, kind people to work with. You know, nobody cares about your achievements or your backgrounds. They just want good people to work with, pleasant people who, you know, they can uh, rely on. So don't worry about 
what research you already have. Just worry about what you, you know, can bring to the table and when they choose you. So that is extremely important. And uh, so, you know, moving forward, once you get these building blocks together, uh, you know, that's when the interview cycle comes in. So again, the mentor mentors will like guide you uh, towards when it is appropriate for you to like, you know, apply and stuff. And I've also seen a few applicants, including myself, who have like spent one more clinical year doing a surgery internship or pre-residency fellowships uh, and things like that. And the reason that, you know, it gives a little bit of advantage uh, is because, you know, with research experience of three to four years, you you establish yourself to be good in research standpoint. What but neurosurgery is not research. Neurosurgery is being a neurosurgeon. You're operating on patients. So they want to know that you are clinically competent. The problem is, imagine being a program director, you know, you get uh, application from God knows who medical college, and then you are trying to gauge how good this patient, this person is clinically, right? And then how do they know the quality of medical training in that institute? So it takes a little bit of uh, more effort from our part to say that, dude, you can trust me. So that's where all these things come in, right? You need to understand from their standpoint. And once you step into their shoes, everything makes it clear. So why do they need great scores? Because they want to know that you have great knowledge fund. Why do you, why do they need, you know, extensive clinical experience and not just, you know, a random observership because, you know, you're going to be operating on somebody's brain and, you know, you're, you're going to be taking care of like the sickest patients in the hospital when they are busy operating. So they need to know that you are somebody that can take those things up, take those challenges and be reliable. So, you know, it takes a little more to prove to them, right? And why do they need to know that you're good at research? Because, you know, they want to make sure that you're not just here to operate, but you are here to advance the field and help the future patients by answering difficult questions. So, you know, all these things kind of like come together. And that's when, you know, um, you will be able to succeed. It's not just one thing that they look at, you know. It's not one negative thing that's going to stop you. So, it's always, it's always a complete applicant that makes it to the other end. You know, if you are boasting about your 270 scores, you can keep doing that in your own space because that itself is not going to get you anywhere. So, you know, having that humility to understand that you're competing against some of the best applicants who've done like MD, PhDs, extensive research will also give you that humility to understand how to be one of them, okay? So it is hard, it is challenging, but it is doable and it takes time. And uh, I, I, I spoke about this in one of my prior interviews where, you know, having a, a superficial awareness in the terms of, you need to be able to step away from your journey and look at your journey and see how your journey is progressing from time to time. I usually do that every three months where I, you know, I step back and reassess how my performance is academically research wise uh, from the, from my knowledge from like, and even my personal life and financial life. So you need to be able to step back and see if you're heading in the right direction because you know, having that awareness will help you steer your career into alternative pathways when you know that you're not making progress. Every Everybody who's done research in neurosurgery didn't make it to be a resident, right? So there are some other factors that, you know, push some people over to over the over the finishing line. So you need to know if you are heading in the right direction. So you 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 broadly know, right? So now you know that you need to get good scores, you need to get good research, you need to get great clinical experience, and you need to have great mentors, you need to have good connections. So you knew, you know the big foundational blocks, right? Now you need to reassess. Okay, so okay, where I am, how many things am I uh, ticking off? And that will help you have that awareness towards where your journey is headed. So, 
it is hard it is challenging but it is doable and people have been doing it so you know i think uh, with how the social media and with how everything has changed you know the opportunities are definitely increasing so i think it's just up to you to capitalize on everything that's changing and use it to your advantage it's hard it's scary but it's still doable uh, and I, i think i've said this but you just have to be stupid enough to dream and stubborn enough to go get it so yeah that's what i believe in and uh, yeah that's and that's a little bit about how uh, i've structured my journey so far thank you dr yekula for being this candid um i'm sure like myself and many other imgs are inspired by your journey um let's uh, uh, so i think dr sunil manjula is here uh, dr manjula are you in uh let me just make sure that uh, he has all the give me one second i think uh, he might be having some technical issues um but he's here dr manjula can you unmute yourself hi dr manjula can you share the slides uh yes i can share the slides give me just a second um let me introduce uh, dr manjula here uh hi dr manjula it's such hi, a pleasure you? having you here um dr manjula dr manjula is a neurosurgeon and a mentor working he's currently working with department of neurosurgery at insight institute of neurosurgery and neuroscience flint michigan in the united states he also works at, at uh, ish warren michigan and directs neurosurgical research at the insight research institute in flint michigan he has been trained in neurosurgery residencies twice first in christian medical college cmc vellore india and again at university hospital case medical center in cleveland ohio he has been an avid researcher and has and a published author with over 100 pubmed indexed neurosurgical manuscripts and over 2000 google scholar citations he has co-authored a textbook on lumbar diffusion having go kabaji um hi okay he has performed original research in both cranial and spinal surgical areas involving surgical techniques and technologies using cadaver studies currently his clinical research focuses on minimally invasive spine and brain surgery ai in spine and brain surgery and neurosurgical robotics in brain and spine thank you dr manjula for being here um let me share my screen right now wow that was a very generous introduction uh, thank you and nice to meet you all thank you we have about 80 plus participants yes all right I'm uh, going to share my screen right now. Let me know if uh, everyone can see it. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. Uh, the floor is all yours, Dr. Manjula. thank you very much uh, you know i just want to make a, a few points here uh, the sunday morning i hope you you all had your fair share of coffee in your system so that you don't fall asleep um, so uh, residency in neurological surgery uh, it's a, an arduous thing hard to get thing but um, i'll tell you about my journey what has helped me uh, in getting to where i got to get and uh, uh, 
I'm very happy and proud that uh, Humans in USMLA is putting this together. And particularly, I want to give a round of applause for TJ and uh, the team. Um, so I would like to talk about residency in neurological surgery, the pearls and pearls. I chose a topic because there are certain things that you should be absolutely be careful about, and you should be warned of certain pearls too. Next slide. My journey started here. This is the picture of my mother, whom I lost when I was 12 years old, uh, with a cerebral hemorrhage. It turned out to be a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and she had a re rupture of an aneurysm on the day 21, and we lost her. That was a game changer of a single child in a family. Uh, and at that point of time, I did not know the difference between neurology and neurosurgery, but I knew for sure that I'm going to do something to fix this damn problem. So that's how it all started. And next slide. So uh, as I joined the medical school and I got more exposed to surgical specialties uh, and neurology, because at that point of time, I still told you, uh, it was... Uh, the accepted term, uh, you know, treatment for aneurysms was uh, still clipping. There was not so much of endovascular going on. So uh, I found neurosurgery extremely challenging. It is the most tissue-friendly specialty because that's the only surgical specialty that we deal with bone, blood vessels from outside and inside, open vascular and endovascular. We operate on normal looking brain for Parkinsonism, for example, DBS. We operate on peripheral nerves. We operate on tumors. The whole you know, gamut of neuro-oncology research lies open in front of you. So I saw that these are the most tissue-friendly surgeons. And we have got the best clinical exam. We can localize and uh, tell you exactly what's the problem, do a prudent medical imaging and localize the lesion and amaze everybody else in the hospital because nobody else can do a good neurological exam like you do. As um, Dr. Gagandeep Singh must have alluded to, we have got amazing diagnostic tools. There was a saying by one of my professors, when in doubt, use 10 ml of contrast. So we have amazing uh, neuro, uh, neurological imaging, starting from advanced uh, sequences of MRIs, endovascular stuff, all that. Not but not the least, remuneration is also a factor. Like at the end of the day, uh, you work very hard, you slog it out, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, it's good to be a neurosurgeon. Uh, like I said, uh, people say it's not rocket science or brain surgery. So there's something, an aura about it. And social stature, right? Mockingly, we used to say, what's the difference between God and neurosurgery? God doesn't think he's a neurosurgeon. So... Uh, all put together, these are the unique features of neurosurgery and that uh, would encourage you or enthrall you. Next slide. There are several subspecialties in neurosurgery. One is neurotrauma. You're mostly familiar with cranial and spinal trauma. Neuro-oncology, tumors. Neurovascular, which is both open vascular microsurgical clipping and also endovascular neurosurgery. Skull-based neurosurgery, which is personally my favorite, the most complex surgery. If you want to be a surgeon who deals with the sanctum sanctorium of things, spend hours drilling, work with plastic surgeons and ENT surgeons and all that. Next is functional neurosurgery, treat functional disorders like epilepsy and movement disorders, starting from Parkinsonism to tardive dyskinesias to whatever, whatever. Spinal neurosurgery, which is... Uh, uh, gathering a lot of momentum because of the, the way the reimbursements are set, set up in this country. Next, peripheral nerve surgery. Again, peripheral nerve surgery, uh, you, you sort of compete with orthopedic surgeons and the plastic surgeons because they also do the same. Uh, pediatric neurosurgery, uh, it encompasses all the above specialties in the pediatric age group. Next slide. So, so when you uh, when uh, I came to this country, uh, as uh, to just we just explained, I did a neurosurgery residency in Vellore in India. That itself was very competitive, uh, and then I did a fellowship in Japan briefly, and then came to the United States. 
what really helped me was my previous neurosurgical experience. And I cannot wish that for, for the audience in this group because you cannot go back to India or wherever you're coming from and do a neurosurgical residency once and then come back for more, right? That's hilarious. But what I can tell you, these are the things that are really helpful will be a good USMLE score. Thank God that I got into neurosurgical residency fairly earlier because towards the later part of uh, uh, my residency and uh, a few years ago when I was uh, in the residency interview committee at U UConn, uh, the US assembly scores were like off the charts, you know? I've seen people with scores of 270s, 273, you know, all from top medical schools and all that. Next is to do an ex extension. For most of you already graduated, you know, clerkship is out of the question, but externship, post COVID, things are opening up. So that is an option. Observership, yes, comes with a lesser weightage, but they do. Research goes a long way. Any neurosurgical program, you know, uh, would value your research, uh, whether it's, a, even if it's a poster that was presented even if it's a local intramural award for the best presentation or a poster, that is counted very highly. Personal statement. So everybody comes with a story, right? My grandmother had Alzheimer's, my uncle had glioblastoma, like that. People are looking for something really creative and new in these personal statements because people who are sitting on the committee have read many personal statements that talk about Alzheimer's and family member having a glioma. Then ultimately, mentorship. Who are your referees? Are those referees willing to uh, pick up the phone and give a call to the program and say that this guy is awesome. If you are gonna take it, we are gonna take it. That sort of thing. That kind of verification or reiteration goes along. Next slide. So neurosurgery residency is fairly long. Right? Getting in is as difficult as getting out. You should remember the program uh, coordinators and the, the attendings, they are going to work with you for seven years. They are actually going to see if we can train this guy. You see like a rock that we cannot, you know, get into his skull. Is this guy who I want to hear about my patients for seven years, is he communicative enough that you know he can make a good presentation and over the phone in the middle of the night, can I make a judgment based on what this guy is saying? So you have to be uh, on the top of your communication skills according, uh, I mean, as well as your academic skills. And hence the next one is about the attrition rate. You know, a lot of times in your surgical residence, you know, get out of the program or get fired or whatever. So you are in for a big haul. You need to realize that before you get in. If any of you guys are in visa, now H1B, you know, for six years or whatever, these programs in neurosurgery are all seven years. So seven-year residency program, you should either take a J1 visa or you should get a green card in the interim. What are ways to get uh, a legitimate visa situation? Uh, the programs will... Uh, probably try to exclude uh, if you don't have a, an option to take a J1 or you know you don't have a, a legitimate and valid visa to train for whole seven years because they don't want a candidate to be gone after six years. Fellowship in neurosurgery is optional. So you don't have to worry too much about it. The day you graduate, there is a job waiting for you. Even if it's a J1 waiver, it might actually pay you more because you go to you know, far remote places. So that should not be a problem. However, there are some certain uh, financial implications to doing a seven-year residency with uh, salaries hovering around 50 to 60K, especially if you're a family with uh, kids, you know, that is a big factor. And if your spouse is in another city, you know, that is another hardship. At the end of the day, mentorship is what makes you and breaks you. I can tell you that for sure. And I myself mentored many medical students, uh, particularly neurosurgical aspirants. Halfway through, 
several of them went to do vascular surgery and urology you know, for various reasons, right? If you want to have a good night's sleep, uh, you know, that's certainly not neurosurgery for you. Next slide. So these are the useful links uh, to know uh, what is neurosurgery residency, what are the neurosurgery residencies, etc. You can look at uh, the match uh, pages and see what percent of US seniors matched, how many of them were EM, NM, uh, foreign medical graduates, etc. So ultimately, at the end of the day, I could tell you that for a foreign medical graduate to match in a program with only one residency program, very unlikely, right? The chairman or program director who interviews 60 candidates with stellar US letters, US research, and you know everything done right, it's very difficult for them to, to say, no, 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 no. I want to take this other kid who is a foreign medical graduate who's stellar. They have to do a lot of justifications. And unfortunately, the neurosurgical residency programs are not uh, uh, not expanding in numbers exponentially over the years. So what we need to see is that your program uh, should know you. Your best chance of getting into a neurosurgical program is the program that knows you. I cannot reiterate this more. The program that knows you, the entire faculty team knows you, he, they think that you are communicative, intelligent, good guy, hard worker. That's all they care. And that's what happened uh, in most of our FMGs who are neurosurgeons in this country today. So AANS is our uh, mothership organization, American Association of Neurological Surgeons, and CNS, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. They're very committed to uh, neurosurgical education. And these are the links that you can look up. Uh, next slide. ACGME specialties, you can go under neurosurgery and see what special uh, departments there are. Next. So when you start preparing for uh, your residency application, you have to list awards and honors separately. If you are in the top one percentage of a class, you should write there um, in the personal statement or whatever, so that it can really meet the eye of the reader. If you are working towards a patent uh, in the US or in your own home country, that goes a long way. There are certain um, you know, programs that favor uh, PhDs um, a lot. But remember, if you have not yet started uh, on the PhD track, uh, you are not uh, losing your breath on that because PhD itself is a long time. And then neurosurgery residency is seven years. Neurosurgery of seven years has got two years of built-in re uh, research time. Maybe you'll get some reduction in the number of years if you already have a PhD. So all other uh, typical um, additional training that people do like MPH and MS epidemiology and all that, they are not heavily counted in neurosurgical training. Neurosurgeons uh, um, are meant to be in the OR and you've got a strong passion for research. We are not against them, but uh, we don't really particularly most of the programs don't say, wow, for an MD, PhD. So if you're coming from a country where PhD is not a built-in part of the program, like in Egypt, so um, you put your best fit forward, observership, research, have a good mentor, awards and honors, make sure that the guy writes a good letter for you. Uh, these are the pearls for getting into residency. Next slide. This has been my journey. I cannot overemphasize about mentorship. This is a textbook, uh, which is available on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and everything. It's called Lumbar in the Body Fusion. Uh, it's uh, published by Elsevier, the largest medical publishing company in the UK. It's a textbook on spine. Uh, you see my name as a first author. And bottom of the list is Dr. Steinmetz, who is the chairman of neurosurgery at Cleveland Clinic. Next slide. This is a book. Mentorship goes a long way. This is my preface to the textbook. It requires, you know, over two years of hard work, burning midnight oil to get a book done. Because as you can see, I was the junior most guy uh, in the author's list. So you do the major lifting, right? So there is no, uh, there, there's a saying that if you train well in your, Training around, you won't bleed too much in your battlefield. 
Next slide. Work hard, play harder. Um, hard work always pays. Uh, you might uh, uh, lose a lot of sleep, but at the end of the day, you crack your head, follow your goal, and then the, the whole life of fun is ahead of you. Next slide. I'm more than happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Manjula, for uh, being really candid in this interview. Um, and I open the floor for any questions to my co-moderators. Hi, Dr. Manjula. Uh, I don't know if you remember me, but uh, when you were at UConn, you, uh, I was one of your applicants and you interviewed me. And uh, I did end up matching at University of Minnesota and it's such a privilege to uh, join this amazing session as one of a, a resident uh, uh, who's just sharing the journey. So just wanted to say hi. Thank you very much. And what's your name again? It's Anadeep. Wow. <laughs> small world <laughs> small world small world nice talking to you same same here sir dr angit would you like to start yes um thank you for the opportunity allowing me to join this panel and uh, i'd like to wish everyone here including the esteemed neurosurgeons a good morning and a good evening, which I'm sure are um, freely exchangeable synonyms for people who work this hard and this long in hospitals. Um, the questions that I'm about to pose have been gathered from the uh, individuals who've chosen to join this meeting, and they've also been prepared from our personal experiences. Some of us, uh, a lot of us are in different phases of uh, preparing or applying for the residency process and um, ultimately resulting in a neurosurgical residency. So the first question that I have is, um, both of you focused extensively on building a research profile as neurosurgery is a research oriented field. It is, uh, I'd go so far to say as um, nascent and it has a lot of opportunities, a lot of problem statements that require solutions. So for those, what would your ideal research profile look like in terms of what would be the fractions that you devote to um, maybe smaller clinical studies, case reports, as opposed to um, outcome analysis, meta meta reviews, and um, how would you partner that with basic science research or lab research, bench research, if an if a particular candidate is able to get his or her um, toe in through the door for a lab? So good question. Um, it has got multiple facets to it um, because. Uh, Everyone has a, a strong interest and uh, uh, a lot of it can be adjusted and modulated according to your area of interest. Suppose uh, you are a person who is interested in neuro-oncology. Most of your uh, mentoring has been going on uh, in the area of um, oncology. So then you can do some outcome stuff, publish a career case report. But it's always good to have a basic science experience if you're looking at a neuro-oncology career because that's something that you're going to see the whole seven years of your residency. So make it, making a story with a sense, you know, a direction and a passion, that's very critical. Now, clearly when somebody looks at um, the review, uh, the re reviewer looks at the applications. These days, uh, Angad, there are so many predatory journals, right? So uh, it's not very advisable to publish your uh, work in a journal of obscure neurosurgery, right? Uh, I uh, say that with a pun because there are a lot of journals. I get a lot of emails saying that, Dr. Manjula, your article we have reviewed, why don't you come to Paris and give a presentation and uh, uh, you be the, uh, the advisor for this particular section of the journal and all that. So always, See, you might spend, say, three months uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular rotation. You make sure that you get something on the CV that's worth it, uh, rather, rather than just line uh, statement that I spent you know, a few months in a lab. So that's very important. 
with every rotation, you should take something that uh, the world cannot see or it is not on PubMed, right? When I say uh, uh, systematic analysis, uh, meta-analysis, all these kind of things is not a, a single man thing, right? It's like a war. You need to have so many friends, partners, right? So if you look at um, an opportunity, you know, I, I can tell you the name of a certain neurosurgical program where five residents come together and each of them write four papers. Imagine if you write four papers by yourself by end of the year, imagine the return of getting 20 papers because you are co-authors with your friends, right? So at least four of them, your first author, you know, certain number of them, you know, uh, in, in the other additional authorships. So your CV is packed with a lot of research. Then the thing is that, is it in one area that can clinically, uh, that can show your uh, uh, clinical interest and passion? So uh, rather than doing all by yourself, you know, just identify a group of people who can write multiple papers and share authorships. That's the way to go for it. Basic science is not for everybody. You know, I don't see myself holding pipettes and burettes and doing uh, that kind of thing because it was not uh, part of my training abroad. And then when I came here, I didn't have the opportunity to do so, those things. So my research, a lot of it was in the cadaver dissection. If you can, as a surgical aspirant, if you can do some original cadaver study, some kind of morphometrics and publish them, that is very highly valued. And not everybody gets a chance to do uh, research, you know, developing technology or, you know, identifying something really path-breaking. Uh, the time is too, too short for that. Uh, I had to take a year off uh, to do some research in Boston and come up with an original invention. And uh, I was the only MD on the team. And uh, it uh, got published in uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Focus. Why I bring focus is because Journal of Neurosurgery has got a subsection called Focus, which is on PubMed, but it's uh, not printed. It's only online. But it's a very, uh, very respectable publishing group. It's peer reviewed. Uh, uh, they split hairs on that. And uh, very. Uh, very... Pardon? I think. Uh... Sorry, that's it. Uh, Evans, um, where we apologize. It's it's technically... Okay. So, okay. so uh, uh, look at a neurosurgical focus and identify a topic. And uh, uh, you know, if uh, uh, if you are able to submit a paper, there's a good chance that you'll hear back at least three months. If you hear back in three months, then at least you can decide whether this is going to be the uh, the home for this puppy or uh, you're taking this to another journal, right? So use your time very wisely. Your research should culminate in something which is ideally on PubMed or a poster or you know a platform talk or whatever it is. So choosing a mentor wisely, you cannot work in a lab, Nobel Prize winning lab, but there's no the visiting medical student has ever been a co-author in the past five years. That's a bad gig, right? Because nobody's going to believe that, oh, you are seeing that Nobel laureate every day. So that interaction is very important. Uh, that mentorship is very important. Who's going to make the call? Who's going to write the letters? Um, in neurosurgery, that goes a long way because it's a very small community. Everybody knows everybody. Um, thank you for your very detailed answer. And you know, it's brought a lot of points into focus for the rest of us to work upon in the future. Um, Following the tail end of your answer, you, men you mentioned uh, mentorship, and um, I just wanted to ask, how would you guide us on fostering a, a healthy yet professional relationship with uh, um, our mentors or our potential mentors that would ultimately result in um, transitioning from a research role to a clinical role? Um, can you please explain the last part of it from a uh, like a research role to a clinical role as a resident? No, from pre-residency to residency. So if, if I'm currently working as a postdoctoral researcher in a lab under um, a clinician scientist who is working as a neurosurgeon and he's also the head of my lab right now. So 
how should i foster my relationship with him or her depending upon the situation uh, resulting in a tr successful transition to residency so uh, let me tell you this when you're working in a basic science lab you are a sort of uh, uh, alienated from the clinical world pretty much if you're doing serious basic science research so i would do uh, to expand the horizon by going for uh, medical conferences neurosurgical conferences uh, which is held in the uh, institution like usually say for example every monday or every wednesday the neurosurgery uh, meetings are there where the residents present cases and all that so number one is to attend those meetings without fail so that your co residents will know you oh yeah angad is a good guy you know we love him so they put in a word to say that you know what that guy is very good very smart very hard working very humble respectful you know he can take our orders he's a good egg that's very very important the other part is the extra mural part outside the institution you should go for national meetings and uh, uh, identify like minded people who could be potential mentors they might ask you to uh, hey why don't you come and um, shadow me for a month right it's important to get a neurosurgeon's letter uh, from another institution uh, in the application pool so always reach out for extra mural things suppose there is a cadaver uh, lab set up in your institution be the first one to mop the floor and get the instruments and you be the first one to come last one to go show that you are on it white on rice that's very very important so ultimately as i told you before your best chances are at the place where you currently work not in some place else not certainly a place where there is only one spot per year right your best spot is a place where there is a history of taking formal graduates they are willing to work with the uh your uh, abroad training your global accent and what not and what not everything matters thank thank you dr manjula for uh, such an insightful answer we have a question from the chat box will a phd in neuroscience molecular neuroscience help for neurosurgery residency yes and no because uh, if there is only one residence resident in a program they will not want uh, not saying that all the residents are cut monkeys but uh, we want people on the floor taking call you know seeing patients and all that okay. uh, with the given residency work hour restriction uh, we have to engage you to train you rather well so as an educator the problem is you don't want your resident to go run to the lab every free moment you know ordering your reagent and looking at your stuff in the lab whereas in major academic centers for like example duke for example stanford for example they prefer uh, phd's in molecular biology i have had many friends who have done phd's in molecular biology i myself had two colleagues with md phd's they did nothing with their phd once they got into residency so uh, for the, uh, the 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 person who asked the question if you want to pursue your research in molecular biology alongside your residency please choose a program that really cares for and values for your your molecular biology research and uh, uh, i have seen uh, residents who even after do a phd they took two years of uh, research time which is you know sort of structured into the program when i was a resident i could do a clinical fellowship enfolded into the residency as a part of a, instead of the research time because i had done enough research in my life so uh, phd in neurosciences is absolutely amazing and uh, neurosciences and uh, uh, and allied areas are a big part of the neurosurgical training program and the whole repertoire of things and uh, 
in our board exams, we get a lot of questions from uh, uh, sciences. So you will ace them all and wish you good luck. Thank you so much. I think that answered the question perfectly. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Yekula, um, and this is again from the chat box. Um, how did you develop research skills to get patents like essays? Because coming uh, from a different country, uh, we don't really know how to navigate these challenges and how to get into grants as a foreign medical graduate. Would you be able to kind of comment on that? Yeah, thank you for that question. So uh, unlike Dr. Manjula, I have gone the basic science route and uh, definitely didn't have much or any experience to say uh, before I started that. But, you know, the design of the labs is such that they initially spend time training you. So during that period, how well you take up that opportunity and not just learn how to do stuff as a mechanical robot, but instead, you know, going back and understanding why you're developing that assay, reading up and uh, figuring out the nuances and tweak and being able to not just do an experiment, but design an experiment and take it forward. You know, that analytical thinking is what will add to your technical skills. So, so I will questions... tell you a little... Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 please go ahead, sir. No, my, my case was a slightly different uh, situation because uh, my... Uh, research and what we developed was in the area of surgical robotics. Um, I did not invent those things from scratch. There was already a Harvard professor who was making a robot for cardiac surgery. I joined them and the whole idea was to write an NIH grant together and find a neurosurgical uh, use for that particular thing. All right, so you know, not everybody gets a patent or uh, will get a patent, and it's uh, not necessary to to do that either. What is important is you know identify your strengths and weaknesses very early. The Bay Area saying goes, "Fail fast." Right? You know that this is not working for you, then move to the next quickly. You know, without batting an eyelid. I, as I told you, I have no experience with molecular research. If I go there, I will be a, a, a declared disaster. Uh, but, um, you know, techniques and technology, you know, that's very important. Right? When I trained in India, we had so many patients and uh, not that we were maiming people, but, you know, we had a lot of hands-on experience. You know, I sort of perfected my technique uh, from India. But the US has got a lot of technology to offer, which I never had, you know? So it's a, it's a marriage of technique and technology. In the question that you asked, when you choose your research, choose something which is already halfway through, and then you can make a uh, big difference in a short time. Do you hear me, Anu? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there are always, you know, those structures that are already built up uh, by, you know, the people in the lab and stuff. So when you go in, you'll be able to take some of those uh, techniques that they've developed to, you know, drive the project to the next level. So definitely, yeah. So the thing is, uh, most of these uh, uh, lab uh, research, first of all, uh, you know, it depends on how big your lab is, right? Uh, are you able to use a lot of the resources uh, that are in the lab, such as help from a postdoc or a uh, for a, or an undergrad, right? You that that um, ecosystem is very important because you are not going to even if you sit twenty three hours in the lab, um, you know, it's very difficult to find a at the end of the day, get a nature paper or something out of it, right? Uh, are you working in a molecular lab or? A... Yeah, I, I worked in a basic science molecular biology lab. But let me tell you this, you know, I mentored a lot of students in the cadaver lab. It's very easy to publish something on cadaver lab. 
the morphometrics, the approaches, the angles, and you know all that. So at the end of the day, what did you do in your research? You know, you washed dishes and you inoculated a few things. You did ran some gels, and so. But at the end of the day, there's nothing to show. Uh, forget nature paper. You know, in nature paper. If you're the fifteenth author, also that's valid, right? But um, your contributions are not uh, really appraised well uh, when you uh, when you go to this science lab. That's my feel for a for a medical graduate you know, because uh, what difference is it going to make? Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Manjula. I think uh, I mean uh, we have uh, two different speakers today, like Dr. Anudeep Yekula, having a lot of research in the basic um, kind of. Uh, uh, morphological science and you being a clinical researcher so this is a this is a great conversational topic and I, I believe uh, you know everyone going into neurosurgery have two different perspectives like how we can move um, out of this uh, 89 people how many people are hardcore gung-ho neurosurgery applicants <laughs> I believe we have like uh, three to four questions those they they look like hardcore neuro uh, I mean neurosurgeons so I wish them the best. Um, Dr. Yekula, uh, do you have uh, any insight on, on the same topic? Like, you know, coming from India, how do you even like step into um, the, the research here, like into the neurosurgical research, be it basic or translational? At least in my case, or uh, what I've seen uh, my colleagues uh, do in the terms of getting a research opportunity is uh, given how everybody is very active on social media or, you know, they have their job postings online, you know, you can find what opportunities are available. And even if not, you can just, you know, send, uh, compile a good formal email and formally reach out uh, requesting for an opportunity. And in that request, if you're able to personalize, um, you know, talking about how their research was something that you enjoyed and, you know, compiling a good CV from your behalf and sending it is a good, is a good and an obvious way to like, you know, get a research opportunity. And when you're doing a sub-internship or when you're doing, um, when you're out uh, to uh, pr present at a meeting or attend an annual conference. So that's when you also have a few more opportunities to connect with uh, leaders in the field and other neurosurgeons, and you can request an opportunity. And these are the kind of ways that people have traditionally used uh, to get uh, research opportunities. And, you know, uh, people are receptive. And if they don't respond, you know, it's it's because they're busy or they, they're occupied or they don't have an opening. So being mindful of their time is also extremely important. And if they don't respond, you can, you know, send a follow-up email in a couple of weeks to see if they have have uh, reviewed your application or reviewed your request. So, you know, being mindful of how we reach out also dictates how, uh, what sort of a person you are to work with. So, you know, these are the ways that uh, like people like us have used to get research opportunities. There, there's always research uh, ideas and there's no doubt of them. You just got the right person and, and willing to commit some time and effort. Uh, that's what ultimately it comes to. Uh, so feel free to contact me by email or phone anytime. Um, Tejasvi we has my email uh, which can be shared, which is yes. sunil.manjala.gmail.com. So feel free to reach out to the moderators and you know we'll connect you to the right person. Yeah. Um, I do have Dr. Bhavya um, as my co-host. Uh, she also wants to ask some questions. Um, Dr. Bhavya, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Tajasvi. Um, hi, Dr. Manjula, and hi, hi. Anadi. Nice to see you after such a long time. Um, I'm a third year medical student in India right now, and I'm really passionate about neurosurgery. I have a couple of questions, which I sort of came up with a group of medical students who are interested in neurosurgery as well. And my personal experience too. Very first question for you, Dr. Manjula, and follow up to what you said regarding PhD candidature. Um, so we do understand that having a PhD degree might somewhat help in, in the matching process at some places, but do you think undergoing or being enrolled right now, for example, if someone who's doing a PhD side by side applying for the match, is that seen as superior or inferior or doesn't make any difference in the application process? 
um, just like I mentioned earlier, uh, PhD is a long haul, right? Uh, from country to country and from uh, program to program, it can vary. It can be even three and a half years or three years in, in a country like UK to even uh, five, six, seven, eight even, right? So uh, PhD is not something that which is very finite and you can control with respect to time. So first of all, uh, like uh, let me give you an example of uh, uh, MD PhDs who take two years of clinical time, then PhD, and then come back for two years of clinical time. So there are some programs which don't look that very favorably uh, uh, in the sense that when you go for doing complete PhD, you lose that clinical touch and whatnot. So that is one element to that, especially when you do some inf something in folder. In your case, when you are from India, I think if you can do a PhD, but alongside do some clinical publication and clinical observerships and you know uh, attending the conferences or something, that is not too bad at all. But make sure that you complete your PhD so that nobody tells you, well, her med school was five years ago. Right. Um, I just uh, want to reinforce one more thing. For example, if someone is doing a PhD, is it wise to apply for residency while doing a PhD? Like, would a program director view it as a good point or a negative point that you might not have the exact time that's required to do residency while doing a PhD? There is no way any program will want a candidate to do a PhD during the residency. I come from a program where people have done all kinds of things in, in Folter. I myself have served on a Coulter grant committee, uh, Coulter as in C-O-U-L-T-E-R. Uh, they, they give a lot of research grants and uh, I was on the oversight committee for a year during the residency, during my research year. That kind of thing is excused. I had one of my seniors just a year ago who uh, completed a, uh, MBA uh, during the residency. Those are far and few in between. I mean, it's, it's very kind of rare because people wanted like unwavering commitment for time in the residency program. Great, thank you. Uh, my next question. And also, for you. And also Bhavya, the thing is, uh, you are going to tell uh, the program that I started a PhD and I'm leaving it halfway through. That is right. even more detrimental. Because it was, oh, she's very unsure. She might leave the neurosurgery residency also halfway through. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you. Thank so you because the direction and focus are very, very important. Perfect. So like you mentioned that you've done already a residency before here in India, and you mentioned a statement that it sort of helped you. Yes. So I want to understand that why would you say that um, having, or, or let me rephrase it, how do you think having done a residency before helped you over, over the other applicants in the race, if at all it did? Absolutely. Like I didn't have a score of 270, to be very honest with you. Secondly, uh, I came to this country to work in a cadaver lab as a, a postdoctoral fellow. I was doing my own research. I was uh, injecting heads and making approaches and publishing and all that uh, under my mentor. Uh, at that time, Professor Alan Cohen, who is now the head of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. He was my mentor. He gave me uh, a, a, a free ride to do whatever, whatever I wanted to publish. And I published a ton with him. I believe I have at least 10 papers published with uh, Professor Alan Cohen. So the autonomy that you get as somebody who's already trained and accomplished, uh, that is very different from uh, somebody who does not have that experience. There is a person by name, Shane Tubbs. Have you come across that name? Uh, not yet. Shane Tubbs is an anatomist. He has probably like 700 publications on PubMed. He publishes very aggressively. So if you were to work in a lab with him, doing a PhD in neuroanatomy, for example, that sounds like a good proposal because everybody in the world and their grandmother knows Shane Tubbs, right? So uh, choose the mentorship and the program very wisely and uh, 
uh, like I said, then doing a PhD and having a passion for it, that is not a negative thing for application. But only thing is that certain programs with, say, for example, only one candidate, they don't want the candidate to just disappear doing lab research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manjil. Right. That sounds good. I'm so sorry. So um, my next question is that how much um, wait dates, or as you said, that having a prior experience clinical or in basic sciences research, it sort of helps one to actually um, put it into use when once you enter the great world of United States. Um, how much importance does having research in med school outside U.S in neurosurgery, even if you've published in great journals like JNS, neurosurgery, WNS, has on your application as compared to the other applicants? So regardless of wherever you are, as I mentioned earlier, you can do you know, three months of rotation in Nobel laureate's lab, but if nothing comes out of it, you know, uh, it is not really worth it. It just means that uh, you are shadowing this gentleman or whoever that is, and, and walking around. But in this day and age, Bhavya, th there are no boundaries. You can publish in World Neurosurgery sitting in India. You can publish Journal of Neurosurgery Focus article sitting in India. Right? Journal of Neurosurgery has got the whole list published for a whole year. You can choose a topic and find a mentor, even in India or in the United States, and uh, submit a manuscript. As I told uh, Anu earlier, you know, you will know in three months whether if it's going to be published there or not. You send it out to the next one and the next one. By the time you are ready for application, at least uh, you will have a handful of publications. So it's not necessary that you should have a, a US mentor for all these things. The content is more important than the co-authors. Right. Um, my next question is to Dr. Yekula. So um, can you please tell us more about the availability of postdoctoral? I think it's to both of you. Um, can you please tell us more about the postdoctoral positions available as to how to come across them, how to find them? Because there are some programs who don't put advertisements for uh, postdoc fellowships available. And what is the status in terms of salary? Because as to what I've come across and as to what I've heard from some medical students is that um, salary is some departments decide the income or their salaries and compensations on the basis of their prior achievements, while some departments, irrespective of the fact how much you've done in the past, you won't get paid at least for six months and vice versa. So what is the heterogeneity in terms of postdoctoral fellowships along with their incomes, if someone wants okay. to be paid in the beginning, they could do that. Okay, so the first part of the question, uh, in order to get research positions that are not published uh, online, you can reach out to people with active labs, people who are academic, um, and you excuse can- Excuse me, one moment, I have to go. Um, you know, uh, I probably have to leave the meeting now. Um, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. You can uh, post the questions and I can get your answers, you know, after the meeting. Sure. Thank you. So More much. than happy to help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Manjula. Good luck. Dr. Manjula. Thank you. Hello. Okay. So, yeah, you can reach out to them and request for a position. And, you know, not all postdoctoral research positions are published and they are available. So, you know, sometimes they make up a position if they really want some more manpower. So it's just about reaching out and asking for it. The second part of uh, the question, uh, the salary aspect. So the reason why a lot of medical students, especially from abroad with minimal to no experience, start off as uh, unpaid uh, is because, you know, it's just hard for them to justify their grant funding to go towards somebody who might not be as productive right now or maybe in the next three, four months. So it's like they're taking a chance on you and they're trying to invest their space and uh, time on you. So it kind of makes sense in the terms of you would start off as an unpaid position. 
Uh, and some institutes have this culture of not paying at all for whatever the time you are at where you have to secure your own funding and you know by talking to the postdocs who are already there you would know that I don't have you know data on which programs pay versus which do not but the the, the reason is that you know in 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 just like clear, honest terms, you are free labor and you are publishing. So they kind of know that and they take advantage of that and, uh, you know, use your services, which I feel is not the right way. There are certain others who initially take uh, you as an unpaid uh, postdoc and seeing how you progressed versus how you do not, uh, they will, you know, uh, to fine tune your salary. So, uh, you know, it's, I think it's more about establishing yourself and proving your worth is how I see it as. And, you know, if it, if, for, for example, from my perspective, from my end, I started off as an unpaid uh, postdoc, but in three months I was a, I was given a full salary. Uh, they've like seen that I was able to do well and produce academically. So that kind of tipped them to say, okay, let's keep him. And you know, that's what triggered. And for you to start off on a paid position, it's it's a little challenging, uh, but again, if you have like good extensive experience, uh, they might consider you for that. But if you don't have any experience, you are more likely to get a position that's unpaid uh, rather than paid. Great. So as you mentioned that for postdoc, those who don't publish on their websites or on the social media, we should reach out to them. Um, how long before you know, we should reach out to them. For example, someone who's doing internship in India, should they reach out to them or someone who's, um, I mean, what is the exact timeline to reach out to them and follow up that is um, we should reach out, should someone reach out to them? Uh, how, how important are steps for such a position? The point is for a research position, steps don't matter as much. The point is, if you are asking for a job, you should be able to take that job in the next five to six months. So if you reach out to somebody when you're in third year of your medical school and tell them that I need a research job for when I finish my third year, for when I finish my final year, and I'll finish my steps and come maybe after two and a half years, it doesn't make sense, right? So you need to you know, apply to a position when you are like able to go in and do the position. So in that sense, after your internship and you've like finished your steps is the ideal time for, from my perspective, because then you are done with your medical school or very close to getting finished with the medical school. You've done your steps. You don't have any obligations to fulfill, right? And then you can completely dedicate your time uh, being a postdoc. So those are the candidates that, you know, they prefer over people who have 100 other things to do. And this ties into the PhD question you asked. If you're actively doing PhD, how much time will you have for, for you to like work with me and produce academically in my lab? So we want, I mean, like, you know, the our PhDs and neurosurgeons, they want students who have time and who have that flexibility to dedicate as much time and effort into um, into academic publications and that's what's gonna uh, determine what the best time is for you to apply not early but right like I would give it six months before you're ready to start is when the ideal time is. Thank you, Dr. Yekula. I mean, these these all are uh, great answers. And kind of, uh, I have a question that is very specific to one person um, in the chat. Um, he says that he or she says that she's an old graduate and wants to start her USMLE journey in surgery. And she's interested in clinical research. She has her visa. And uh, what would be the first step? She's preparing for step one. So again, at this point, what can she do to actually like, you know, increase her chances to match. So uh, the point with all graduates is that the first thing is if you are out of clinical medicine and you are like out of medical arena, that that like goes against you because 
fresh graduates are fresh with the knowledge and fresh with the clinical component of things and they are more reliable applicants. On the other hand, you might have graduated all like, you know, a few years back, but if you've like done another residency in surgery or neurosurgery, like Dr. Manjila or, you know, a few other applicants that I know. So you've used that time after your graduation to like, you know, refine your clinical skills and that works actually in your favor. So I'm not sure what category you fall in, but if you do not have, you know, a justification of what you done after your graduation, it, it definitely like hurts your chances. Yes, uh, of course, you know, the way again doesn't change much. You just have to follow all the steps that we just spoke about uh, in the terms of, you know, getting good scores, finding great mentors and doing research. So, you know, I think, you know, before you start off your journey, like having a true honest conversation with yourself regarding what your odds are, what your, you know, a clinical trajectory is, uh, will always help you steer it. And uh, like, to be really honest, you know, surgery favors people who are fresh graduates and also who have home country surgical residencies. And that's unfortunately the honest truth. So you again, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but just uh, knowing the ground reality before going in is very helpful so that you don't waste uh, too much of time Medical officer in periphery, I'm unsure how much they consider as a true clinical experience. I've seen that people who do like general surgery residency in India or neurosurgery residency in India are the ones who they feel are good candidates. And that's unfortunately the truth. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gekula. So one of the questions that's, that comes up is regarding sub-internships or as we call them as externships for Indians or any other mm -hmm. medical jobs at US. So what are the um, some of the pointers that they look for into someone externing with them? Is it CV? Is it steps? And also how important are steps? Because I've come across some programs which do provide internships without steps. So what are the entire criteria to have um, a good internship experience? I think to get an intern, I mean, to get a sub-internship or an externship, I don't think they care too much about what sort of a candidate you are. I think they are basically uh, limited by the availability first because they try to like give, give most of the positions to the American applicants. And, you know, we get the second opportunity and second priority. And it's mostly first come first serve basis. And if you are actually meeting all their criteria, you know, they just like give it to you. It's not like residency where they extensively screen you. But if you have, you know, some of the faculty vouching for you and saying, yeah, you know, you know, we should give Bhavya a sub-internship opportunity. So they'll make amendments to, you know, facilitate that. So getting an externship, um, observerships and all is mostly availability based and not so much as how quality of an applicant you are as what I've seen uh, based on my experience. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, one of the questions that I see is that um, how, um, what criteria do the directors or the PIs take when they are to appoint a postdoc fellow? Okay, so if if somebody is considering you to be a postdoc, Depends on what lab it is. For example, in Dr. Manjula's case, he worked in a cadaver lab. So a tr fully trained neurosurgeon is a better applicant, right? For somebody who is in an outcomes lab, somebody with computing and coding experience is a great applicant. For somebody who is being considered to a basic science lab, somebody with you know, experience in molecular biology, uh, you know, those are great candidates. For somebody who is in a global um, 
arena, people with MBH are, you know, better candidates. So it kind of depends on what kind of lab you're trying to target and what sort of skill set you bring to the table. So it's kind of combination. And again, some people are quite flexible and they're willing to give you more opportunities and, you know, have more flexibility to work with you and train you to make you who they want you to be. So it kind of depends, but, you know, you need to play with, play towards your skill set. So. That's a great input. So one follow-up question for that would be that for, as you mentioned, that to work in a lab, you need to have that very specific expertise as to what the lab's pertaining to. What about people who have experience in clinical research and no experience in any of these cadaveric or molecular or coding domains? So um, for people with just clinical experience, the usual trend I've seen is that they fit well into the clinical outcomes lab. Uh, because uh, that, you know, you can work with coders, you can work with computer, uh, like biostatisticians to, you know, ma make up for those skills. But having said that, like, you know, I had clinical experience before, like clinical research experience before coming in, but did well in basic science uh, research arena. So, you know, there's no right or wrong answer, but usually if you were to pick a safe path, you know, outcomes research would be the way to go. And again, even like global research is something that doesn't require extensive prior skill set. But again, with basic science, I've seen like a few people who uh, have failed uh, because, you know, it, it, it takes a little bit more of hard work and a little bit more of luck as well to have projects that are successful. So yeah, it, it kind of depends on which opportunities open up to you as well. Thank you, Dr. Ekula. Thank you for also being, you know, this honest and straightforward while kind of, you know, answering these questions. Um, the last question that I have from you is for the applicants who have already applied, like they just applied a week ago. What would be your uh, kind of uh, a lesson that you have learned from your journey or your kind of observations you want to share moving forward? for the people who want to match into neurosurgery, who have applied into the specialty, sorry. Yep, so if you are applying to, if you've already applied to neurosurgery and you are you know, on interview trial, the first thing is as an IMG, you're not gonna get 30, 40 interviews. So having those expectations right is extremely important and having that morale and not getting disappointed is just such an important aspect of the journey and let me emphasize that like right off the bat so from my perspective it doesn't matter how many interviews you get but how what you make out of each interview is what determines how far you're gonna go so even if it's just one interview you know try to put in your best so that's the first thing the second thing is during uh, the interview process, neurosurgeons are very straightforward people. They don't bullshit around. They, they want answers that are crisp, straight to the point. So they want people who are prepared. So when you're answering, be, be very prepared because if, if you're like making up things, you're not sure, if you're not confident, they're going to weed you out like a brain tumor like that. So, you know, opportunities are important, especially being a pharmaceutical graduate. You know, you need to work on your communication skills and the way you structure your answers. And that's, a, that's you know, a very important aspect of being, uh, you know, a surgical or a neurosurgical applicant, how you refine those skills. And, you know, when you go to uh, annual meetings and stuff like that, you observe people, how they present themselves, how they communicate. And all those things are training you to be more like them. So they're looking for people of their kind. So, you know, you need to perfect those skills. And also, you know, reaching out to the programs after uh, sending out your applications is extremely important. You know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of programs do have internal filters where they, you know, used predefined criteria based on their prior applicant pool to uh, kick out a lot of applicants who they feel are not the right fit. But, you know, in order to stand out, you know, reaching out through an email is an extremely uh, 
a great strategy to like, you know, increase the number of applications. And, you know, if you don't match the first cycle, don't break, it, does, it shouldn't be the end of the journey. And if you are to a point where you've like built all the necessary skill sets to apply, take the first cycle as uh, a learning experience, see, uh, study the layoff plan, see how many interviews you're getting, like, you know, and if you're not getting interviews, try to understand why you're not getting interviews and try to troubleshoot. So use that as an experience. And even while structuring your interview things, you know, choose um, the programs that you don't want to go to first so that you can, you know, uh, practice your skills when you go to interviews that are how, of higher stakes. So having that is really important. And again, like, you know, I cannot emphasize the interview day's performance being the most important aspect of, you know, how you choose, like you do well on your interview day, everything else don't matter. They fall in love with you during the interview day, they will take you no matter what. So, you know, being a, a kind person, being a person that they want to work with. You know, it's just hard to establish that on a Zoom portfolio. But trust me, these people are quick to judge and ha and very sharp to pick up. So if they like you, they love you and they will take you uh, for who you are. So it's it's just so exciting. You know, it's just such a great class of people. You know, they're like sharks that you either swim with them or be eaten with them, eaten by them. So, yeah, it's it's so much fun, I'm telling you. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you for so much for, you know, kind of giving me that uh, insight of sharks. And, and I agree, you know, like they, they, they are pretty quick to kind of, you know, um, judging us because they've seen so many applicants. I would um, just say one minute is how much they will take to judge you. And after that, it's just, you know <laughs> so first one minute it is that's thank it you. yeah thank You're you Dr. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you for you know uh, sharing such an inspiring journey of yours um and respecting the time i think it's time that uh, we move forward to the next session and i will um invite our next moderators <laughs>